You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello and welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. I'm John Townley and I'm joined by club correspondent Ashley Priest to look forward to Aston Villa's Premier League clash with Newcastle United Villa Park on Saturday. Ash, you okay? Yeah, back amongst it. I've had the, the little one for the start of the week. The nursery's been closed and uh, back in yesterday. And yeah, press conference today, John. Looking forward to tomorrow. Two informed teams going at it. We don't like Newcastle very much. They don't like us very much. They're on a bit of form. We're on a bit of form. Someone's got to give tomorrow, mate. And hopefully, yeah, it's us. And Watkins back in the goals again. And yeah, I'm feeling confident for tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be a good one. It'll be a tough game. It's like the definition of a tough game. And it feels like a bit of, a, I suppose, an acid test in a way. I was thinking we haven't been in this, obviously, in this sort of position since we've, um, well, since we've been promoted. We haven't been in this position since, like, what, 2010. So, I remember in the championship, we always used to go into some games and be like, oh, we've won four or five on the bounce and this is now the acid test because we're playing a team that's above us or whatever it may be, a a tough outfit. And that's what this feels like in a way, but only in the Premier League, so it's even harder. They've lost three games all season, which is remarkable, really, the sort of turnaround of where they were, you know, 16 months ago or something under Bruce and now to where they are under Howe to only lose three games are... I think it's Arsenal, I presume Man City away and what was the other one? Liverpool, I think, at the start of the season. The definition of a tough game. Yeah, 100%. The defence are rock solid, really. Dan Byrne left back. you got Shaw and Botman. Been impressed with them. Trippier's good value, isn't he, in poping goal. So, tough enough to crack tomorrow for Watkins and co. So, Villa scored in every game, John, under Emery. That's a good stat to go into. I think they could break a record tomorrow to make it 18. First time since O'Neill's in December 2009. Uh, a score a scoring streak of that magnitude. So, yeah, fascinating tomorrow tactically what how Villa will, will play. I think Newcastle are pressed quite high, won't they? Yeah. With Isaac and Wilson and people like that, that, that. They'll come at Villa. And, yeah, I mean, Villa will be brave. And I think they might have to keep it long now and again, as opposed to playing out from the back log. Like Forrest allowed them to. I don't think Newcastle will allow us such freedom in that sense. So, tactically, yeah, it's it's um, it's wetting the appetite already. It really is. There's a lot that's actually been said at the moment about how Villa are playing. Uh, are they overperforming? How are they playing? How are they defending? They're defending the six at the back and how is Ollie Watkins scoring so many goals? So, there's loads of little sort of minutiae, if you will, in yeah. the game, which, which is really interesting. Um, but as you mentioned, the, for all the stats that are going for Newcastle, there's plenty going for us too. But you look at the games coming up. Obviously, we won six in seven. All of those teams were sort of unbeaten in seven now, isn't it? So all of those teams that we've played are now in the bottom half, obviously including Chelsea. That's no mean feat to do that anyway, even though, you know, this is the Premier League and any game is tough in the Premier League, but the last seven of eight games that we're playing this se- uh, at the end of the season are going to be teams in the top half, plus Wolves away, which is obviously going to be very difficult in itself. So that's the sort of challenge we're, we've got coming now to try and get the European positions obviously in there at the moment but to maintain it I think Newcastle is as I say an acid test and a barometer of how far we've come and where we can finish the season just because those challenges are going to keep coming you know we could beat Newcastle which would be an, an incredible result Huge. but at the same time there's more challenges coming yeah. and that's um yeah if we can do what we want to do this season and maintain where we are you know, what a job that would be um, from Emery. Uh, we'll go on to an injury update ahead of the game. <laughs> They're sort of piling up, aren't they, at the moment? I think Leon Bailey is obviously the latest casualty, which we knew about from, from the game before it. But there's no, as far as I know, there's no um, sort of news of any player returning for this game. Yeah, Emery was quite coy with the, the team news. He was asked about team news and uh, he didn't name names. He, just, he said team, the team news has come at a, uh, when you want, don't want it to come at a bad time. So I asked, about, I asked him at the end, any available? How's Leon? People like that. And he said, it's yeah, Leon's out. They're all out still. Cash, Kamara, Coutinho. So, yeah, I don't think Villa might not fill the bench tomorrow. It might be one of them games. And who comes in for Bailey from the start? Will it be Traore? Or will Emery look to shore things up a little bit more and bring a Dedonka in, in midfield and free up Wendia and push McGinn wide, maybe? I think that might, might, might be the way to go. And hopefully Bailey isn't out, isn't out too long-term. But, yeah, we should have the... I think he got out 10 days to two weeks, didn't he? The yeah. time frame for them to come back last week. So hopefully they're back soon enough. And yeah, we need them back, don't we? We're struggling in terms of numbers. Uh, Emery's still, still pulling rabbits out of the hat, really, isn't he? Yeah, we are looking quite light, especially in those positions, as you mentioned. You've got players like McGinn now dropping back in positions where Emery wouldn't want and like Kamara being, being fit as well. I thought it was interesting. Oh, maybe I'm just reading into it, but there's usually like a post on the Villa Twitter account saying like the injury latest. <laughs> Unless I've missed it, I didn't see that. And then there was no sort of mention about injuries on the um, broadcast section either, which I thought was strange. I hope that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you've got job being injured, Ollie Watkins out for a couple of weeks, you know, those sorts of things. <laughs> and you don't want to mention, yeah, touch with that, that, that isn't the case. Um, yeah. Are there any 
time scales on Matty Cash because I, I think this was around the sort of time that he'd be returning. I think is there any updates on those players? I know it was, was yeah. I think yeah, Newcastle one was the pen, penciled in one. Uh, I spoke yeah. to somebody. Rep- I spoke to his representation as soon as he got his injury. And Newcastle one was the the hope really. So hopefully next week Brentford maybe. Hopefully he's back in training next week. That's the that's the hope in terms of Matty Cash calf injury. And Coutinho's been out for a while, hasn't he? Six weeks and counting, I think, for Coutinho. A bit of a long one for him. Like you say, Kamara's been a funny one. He, I, think, I think Villa rushed him back, didn't they? Against Chelsea. They rushed him back into it. Uh, wasn't quite right. And I think they've been quite quite cautious with him. Don't want to rush him back too soon. And for him to miss the remainder of the season would be pretty, pretty bad. So, um, yeah, eight games to go. They're going to be careful with these these injured players. They the want them in for the running. Because, like me, I think it could go down, I think it could, could go down to the Brighton game, last game for Europe. So, um, the walking wounded are nearly back, John. Yeah, and that's the sort of boost that we're probably going to need in the next couple of weeks. I think this game in Newcastle, sorry, this game in Brentford next week particularly are going to sort of separate where are we actually at because yeah. you'd back us against Fulham at home, you'd back us against Wolves away. The last games of the season are then the crucial ones, but you want to be in a position where they are crucial, don't you? You don't want to go into the, the final three against Spurs, Liverpool and Brighton and thinking that, oh, well, what would it be if we won these games? Because that's, mm-hmm. you know, if we were to get results against them, you'd be thinking, oh, but we blew it against Newcastle or Bright- uh, Brentford. So, yeah, the next two weeks are massive and it's a shame that they aren't back a couple of weeks before and potentially that was because we rushed Kamara potentially that was because um, you know Cash isn't progressed as fast as we wanted or whatever it may be we'll move on to the press conference itself today obviously Ashley we're at Bodymore plenty has been said in the broadcast I thought the main sort of takeaway um, obviously much of it is sort of Emery rejecting Newcastle and his yeah. comments on interesting really how that how he was the solid number one choice and then they went to Eddie Howe and Eddie Howe at the time wasn't particularly sort of regarded in the same light as Uno Emery so in a way, you look at the Newcastle board and think, oh, well, they've spotted two very good managers there. Um, but we know what Emery's, you know, given or going to give to us, or has given already. But uh, Ashley Young was the main sort of takeaway, I thought. Yeah. Um, obviously, his contract's up in the summer. What did he uh, say about that? Quite interesting from, from Emery. He's asked about his contract, but he, he honed in on his performances of late. He's been really impressed with Young. Mm. He, obviously, a lot's made of, made of his age. He's 38 in July. He's knocking on 40, bless him. And he's still doing the business three games in a week in the ice bath, God knows how many times. Um, <laughs> he's still doing it. And Emily said, if you look at it, if you're watching football, he could be 22, 25, yeah. um, as you've seen it like that. So age is just nothing but a number. He's doing the job. He's been really good. He looks after himself. He cares about his physical work. And, and like you say, how old is he? He's playing like a 24-year-old, 25-year-old right back at the moment and... I mean, yeah, he's doing really well in Cash's absence. Yeah, I think he's probably numb to those ice, bath, ice, bath, ice baths by now, <laughs> given top performances. And he's been asked to do a different sort of role as well under Emery, I think. Yeah. But if there's one person that you'd ask him or ask of a player, it would be him because he's done the kind of left wing back role under Antonio Conte, which is <laughs> quite something at his age to do that. Yeah. Um, into Milan only a year or two ago, two years ago now, obviously. But the role he's doing now, you know, when an, an Alex Moreno will push forward into almost a, a left wing position to make up those numbers, Bailey will sort of up, do the opposite on the right, almost tuck into a back three, you know, in a way. So we know he's brilliant going forward in terms of his delivery and what he can produce. He's yeah. obviously got a lot of quality, which we've known about in his first stint at Villa. But to have that sort of defensive awareness and have that sort of nous and how he's developed his game, it's, that shows even more so at the moment. I thought it was interesting as well when Emery was asked about Newcastle in general and he said the question was something to do with you know how far are you away from Newcastle or something like or how, how do you write Newcastle and he mentioned that they've recruited quite you know well in terms of they've done the sort of the young players but then the also the old ones as well so I just thought that's again the sort of what you were saying earlier Ash about Emery viewing Ashley Young as a 24 year old judging by his performances and no doubt the numbers as well like we, we know he comes on his laptop straight after games it's, it's clearly this <laughs> Yeah. knowledge behind that statement and it was interesting that he mentioned that sort of old players and how he's worked with old players as well previously I think Villarreal he said he played with like or played 40 year olds or 38 year olds don't know exactly who they were I think he signed he might have signed Pepe Reina actually for Villarreal if I'm not mistaken who's obviously getting on now to goalkeeper granted but it's that sort of thing yes experience but also a lot of quality and that's exactly what Young brings just say Pinning down to that contract is a is a must. Yep. A new segment, I suppose, to the podcast is the uh, opposition view. Dan caught up with Newcastle Chronicle uh, reporter Aaron Stokes to sort of get the lowdown on Newcastle. So we'll pass over to Dan now. So Aaron, thanks for joining me from the Everything Is Black and White podcast. Now I wanted to get you on just briefly this afternoon and talk about this kind of like rivalry between the two clubs, if you even can call it that, a faux rivalry between the clubs. From a Villa perspective, and this is just my opinion, 
I couldn't care less about, about Newcastle and, and this rivalry that fans seem to hate each other. There's arguments on social media. Firstly, from your perspective, personally, what do you think? Secondly, Newcastle fans as a whole, can you kind of summarise what they might think? And thirdly, where did it come from? Yeah, I mean, in terms of my, myself personally, I'm in the exact same boat as you. I don't really, you know, I don't ever look for Villa's results. I don't really care how well or bad they're doing. Yet they don't bother me at all. I, I think Villa are actually quite a good club. I think if you ask the majority of Newcastle fans, they would say the same. I don't think they see it as a rivalry, but I think there's a small minority that all of a sudden just have taken a, a little dislike to Aston Villa and I, I do think it is a very, very small minority. Newcastle fans are still a bit sour that Villa sent them down in 2009 and there was the whole, you know, sob on the time, who's the next Messiah, <laughs> Ant or Deck? I don't think, you know, they'll ever really let that dare, let that go. They're quite funny. <laughs> I mean, yeah, look, I mean, we can laugh about it now because Newcastle aren't going to get relegated and stuff and I think hopefully it should be forgotten. Look, they're two huge clubs that are massive fan base, you know, former glories, always mm. trying to disrupt the big six. And I think maybe there's just a little bit of rivalry in terms of that. But yeah, I just I just can't see where it came from, really. Mm, I think you're right. That the sub on the time ban and the Anton Deck stuff and being sent down it. But anybody could have sent Newcastle down on that, that yeah. last day of the season. The Championship days as well probably won't have helped to some extent that we were both going down there, as you said, big clubs expecting to get back out of it. So when the two sides came up against each, each other in the Championship, it's almost like this kind of like, my dad's bigger than your dad. Oh, no, yeah. we've got the biggest stadium. Oh, no, we're the biggest club. We're the biggest club to ever be relegated. It's like, well, all right, take that prize then if you want, if, if you want to run with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you've got to remember is Newcastle actually don't really have a rivalry at the moment because Sunderland and Middlesbrough can't mm. really come up. They don't really have many clubs locally to them that are competing in the Premier League. They need, you know, somebody to try and throw a few digs at. So maybe they've just chosen Aston Villa as the, the team they think that they can do that with. I mean, I would like to think that going forward, this rivalry rivalry is that it's a footballing thing now not, I'm not saying that we're going to be the next Man United and Arsenal but you know, two sides that are a rivalry because of their competing for the same spots not that they are a local rival or a local derby if Newcastle and Villa continue the trajectory that they've been on over the last 12-18 months which we'll touch on in a sec we will be looking out for each other's results so I'll be thinking well hopefully Newcastle lose this weekend because Villa will be in the top four because of that by all means I would like to see a rivalry between the two sides from a football perspective because we're both good again absolutely and as I say you know, two massive clubs, huge fan bases that have experienced success in the past, but maybe not so much now. Both teams, you know, for years have been trying to sort of dismantle that top six. And, you know, this season looks like the first time they're actually probably going to do that. Two clubs that are, you know, very much on an upward trajectory. I think, you know, yes, Newcastle have got the takeover and, you know, they've maybe got a little bit more scope to disrupt the top six on a on a long-term basis. You know, Villa's appointment of Unai Emery is you know, an absolute game changer in terms of what he can do with clubs and take them to the next level. So certainly from a football perspective, I think, you know, the next couple of years, you know, that rivalry or that rivalry, you know, the fake rivalry could grow in a sense. The appointment of Eddie Howe was probably seen as a, a potentially as a little bit of a stopgap appointment. He'll be the short term, he'll sort us for the moment. But if we want to get into the Champions League, we'll need to go bigger than him. We'll need to improve on him. The job he's done in the last year and a half or so, and this season particularly, is... It's unbelievable, isn't it? What exactly has he done? What has he got right? He's got pretty much everything right on the pitch, off the pitch. You know, he's got such a fantastic relationship with the fans, even though he's not from the area. He's just transformed every single part of this football club. And lazy pundits will say it's down to money and Newcastle are only in the top four because of what they've spent. But actually, when you look at the players that he's made much better, that he inherited mm. from Steve Bruce, the likes of Fabian Scher, Joel Linton, Almiron, Willick, you know, players that were really you know, sort of hanging on for their future really under the previous ownership or now, you know, in that team week in, week out. So he was certainly seen as a stopgap appointment. I think, you know, when he first came in, it's really funny because it was between him and Emery. And I think mm. you know, the majority of Newcastle United fans really, really wanted you. And Emery, I know I certainly did. But now, you know, it's really, really hard to see how they get rid of him because he's, you know, he's massively overachieving personally. Um, and I think even if Newcastle start to struggle, I don't think there'd be this big, you know, sort of swathe of fans wanting to get rid of him because they really, really do like him and he's got he's got a lot of credit in the bank. Mm. Before I let you go, your thoughts on Villa? Start of the season, I mean, it feels like a long time ago. Start of the season with Steven Gerrard, hopeful mm. of uh, this kind of manager, young up and coming, talks a good game to a certain extent. Players will kind of look up to him, that kind of thing. 
turned out to be an absolute disaster, <laughs> a waste of, of six months or so for the club. Una Emery comes in, wins his first game against Man United. I think we hadn't beat them at Villa Park for 25 years or something. So from the outside looking in, you probably wouldn't be looking at Villa. I mean, we're not going to overtake you and get into the Champions League this season. That, that's not Villa's That's not Villa's aim and it's nothing for Newcastle to worry about really. But there would have been a time this season where you'd have looked over your shoulder down the league table and thought, well, Villa are, are nothingness to, to Newcastle at the moment. They're, they're going to be nowhere near. Now you kind of go, Bloody hell, they're in sixth. It, it's exactly that. I feel like they've just quietly crept under the radar. And, you know, mm. it wasn't really until two or three weeks ago that fans started to think, well, oh, hang on a sudden, they're, you know, they're overtaking Brentford and, you know, they're in the race for the Europa League or, you know, the, the European places. I think Emery is, I mean, what an appointment he was. I, I'll admit when I, when you got Gerald, I thought that was a decent appointment, given what he'd done at Rangers. But, I mean, Emery's just different level everywhere. He's been yeah. pretty much, he's, he's improved the players, he's improved the team. If you do get into Europe, I think you've got a very good shot of winning it, given his record in the Europa League. Especially what, after what happened with Arsenal and the way he was sort of, not hounded out, but, you know, he was sort of a laughing stock and, you know, he couldn't really mm. speak the language. I think it's good to see him personally bounce back. He's got a very clear philosophy that, you know, they, they never really waver from. And yeah, he's doing a really, really good job. As, as we've already mentioned, Bailey is going to be, obviously forcing one change. I can't really see any more than that. I suppose if you go from back to front, obviously Martinez will stay in goal. The back four, you would have thought would say the same. The only yeah. difference would be, no, it's going to stay the same, isn't it? And then <clears throat> you would presume McGinn and Louise start as a holding two, but as you say, the sort of toss-up really is um, what do you do with that sort of right-hand channel position where Bailey might have played in? Do you bring in Callum Chambers and push John McGinn forward or do you leave John McGinn in the holding position and bring Traore on? What are your thoughts on that? Do you know what? I'd throw Bertrand Traore in. I'd throw him in. Uh, play him on, yeah, play him yeah, high and wide with, with, with Watkins maybe, drag out wide. I think he'd be on Dan Burns' side. So two very similar in terms of their physical attributes. Scored two in two. His confidence would be sky high, Bertrand. Players like that, they tend to score in spurts and they hopefully continue yep. momentum. So there's two decisions to make for Emery tomorrow. There's Does he draft Troy in, in a like-for-like like change for Bailey or does he change it up a bit and um, bring in a more defensively capable midfielder, whether that's Dendonka? I can't see Callum Chambers coming in. So Dendonka coming in, yeah, pushing McGinn out wide and, and, and pushing Buendia up with Watkins. So, yeah, this used to be had there, but I won't, I won't be too fussed with, with any, really. If you're pushing me for an answer, I'd say just give Troy a start. Predictions, oh, I don't know. It's really difficult, this, because <laughs> we want to be as positive pos- as possible, but I'm not... Um... I'm not coming into this sort of uh, as positive as what I was against Nottingham Forest, for example. It's difficult because Newcastle, as I said, don't, they don't give anything away. You know, they only lose a few games across the season at the moment. And yeah, it's difficult. Did you take a point now? Point now? Yeah, well, end a bit negative, but I've... A bit negative, that is from a... Well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at the teams that they've lost to and I think well if we can be the fourth that they lose to then that says everything about where, where we are I don't know why do you think we're going to win I think a draw is probably the, the the most likely outcome of this one the Villa needs to be very good tomorrow especially I mean Toro and Mignonez we can't have been fantastic haven't they of late as a pair they're back to the best then pair but tomorrow they've got it we're up against it Isaac is on fire looks a really good player doesn't he nearly 70 million they spent on him yeah huge money but huge yeah. money I've seen his goal last week against Brentford as well special player him so they got the work attack some other two centre halves. Yeah, I'll probably go one one. Isaac and Watkins to score, maybe. Yeah, I, that's probably the best way to play. I think it's it's a weird one because both teams are very solid defensively. Obviously, they yeah. concede very few goals, and we've conceded one goal from over playing seven. So, but then you flip flip it and you say Isaac's in great form. Watkins is in the form of his life, and we've got goals in every game so far. So it's something's going to give. You just hope that it falls in our balance. But I'll, I'll go with Desmond because you've only gone on what as a one. Four goals. Wow. <laughs> I can't score one all, can I as well? Cheers, Ash. That'll wrap uh, <clears throat> us up for today's preview. Myself, Matt and Dan will be doing the post-match on Saturday. Dream team. <laughs> we'll catch you then. Cheers, everyone. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue and Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your thoughts and comments. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, up the villa.